Hello, I'm Brookie. Welcome to VBF Online. Please visit our website, vbf.org, and while you're there, you can watch the latest message. Follow us on social media. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also donate to our ministry by going and clicking the Tithe Here button. You can do that, or you can also mail us a check. If you have a cool story that you would like to share with us, you can email us at share at vbf.org. Thank you so much for watching BBF Online. We hope that you enjoy the message. Good evening, church. Let's stand to our feet.
Well, church, turn to someone, greet them with a wave, and let's continue to worship together. Oh 
I've lived stories that proved your faithfulness And I've seen miracles my mind can't comprehend And there is beauty in what I can't understand Jesus, it's you Jesus, it's you And I believe the wonder-working God, you're the wonder-working God. All the miracles I've seen, too good to not believe. You're the wonder-working God, and you're here because you love. All the miracles we've seen, too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. Resurrect a man with my own hands But just the mention of your name Can raise the dead So all the glory to the only one who can Jesus is you Jesus is you And I believe in the one who out church and let's believe it tonight we've seen cancer disappear we've seen broken bodies healed don't you tell me he can do it don't you tell me he can do it i've seen real life resurrection i've seen mental health restore don't you tell me he can do it don't you tell me he can do it We'll see families reunited. We'll see pride and colors return. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. We'll see troubled souls delivered. We'll see families finally free. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. We'll see sin. Oh 
restore our faith tonight, God. We need you. Come on, let's give him all the praise tonight. We love you so much, God. You may be seated. Well, good evening, Valley Bible Fellowship. How are you guys all doing? You guys good? Some energy in the house tonight. Feels good. Feels good. It's probably because I'm wearing cowboy boots, huh? That's probably what it is. Just getting ready for Easter, you know what I mean? It's coming. If you're looking for boots, boot barn, hey. Um, if you are a first-time visitor, uh, welcome. We love to have you guys here. If you are a first-time visitor, you can stop by the hub uh, in our foyer. We got something for you. We would like to meet you just to talk to you, get to know you. Thank you for joining us here this evening. Online, uh, come on down. We'll see you later. We also want to let you guys know, women, there is an event happening for you Sunday, March 27th called Women of Wisdom at 12.30 p.m. in Station 316 here at our East Campus. And uh, it is, it is going to be jam-packed with uh, some amazing speakers. We have Mary Maggard, we have Debbie Tweed, Brenda Ratliff, uh, Ratliff and they're coming to speak. Combined, uh, they have over 166 years of experience walking with Jesus. And so uh, if you are interested, please RSVP to vbfwomen.com. And uh, you can join us for that. Also, there is uh, the Encounter Tour 2022 with our uh, guest, Lisa Turkhurst. And there is going to be some awesome worship there if you'd like to join. It's Saturday, May 28th at 6 p.m. Tickets are on sale right now. You can go to ticketweb.com or go to vbfwomen.com. You can also buy in person at our church offices Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We also want to let you guys know about something special happening. It's a uh, one-day live stream conference. It is a blended and blessed. It's called Blended and Blessed. It's by Family Life on Saturday, April 20th. Second at the VBF Tachpi campus. This is for step family couples, single parents, dating couples with kids, and those who care about blended families. Blended and blessed will change and inspire you. Go to VBF.org and click the events tab to find out more information. The conference is free. We also want to let all you men know Man Cave is coming. If you didn't get a card on the way in, it's coming for you, whether you like it or not. Tuesday, March 29th, here at our East Campus in Station 316. And uh, you don't want to miss out on this. We also want to remind you guys we are having a Hollywood service April 10th. That's a Sunday. And uh, it's going to be on Hollywood Boulevard at 6 p.m. If you're interested in coming, drive on down. Gas is cheap. 5941. <laughs> or carpool. Uh, 5941 Hollywood Boulevard, uh, park in the car dealership. Lastly, tithes and offerings, and uh, it's the same thing we've been doing for years. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will get into one more worship song. Let's pray this. Father, we thank you for the time that we have here together. We ask that you would do more with the time than what would be done otherwise, God. We ask that you would bless the offering and the giver. Prepare our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us here tonight. God bless Pastor Gennaro for the message. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, come on. Let's stand back up together.
Let's give him all the praise tonight. We love you, Lord. You may be seated. How you guys doing? I'm, uh, can we give it up for the worship one more time? That, that'll make a grown man cry. Um, for those of you guys who don't know who I am, my name is Gennaro. I run the high school uh, here at our VBF church. We actually have the high school in here today. They're up in the, in the middle. So if they, uh, if they cause too much ruckus, uh, just throw something at them. And uh, that usually uh, works. I'm excited. I'm excited to do this Bible study. If you haven't been here before, we've been doing a verse-by-verse Bible study. Pastor Hector Rizzo just did Acts chapter 5 last Wednesday, and today I have the opportunity to jump into Acts chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your notebooks, get those out. We're not going to waste any time. We're going to be jumping into Acts chapter 6, and we're covering this entire chapter from start to finish. But here's why I'm excited. I'm excited if, if you know me, I love to be honest. I love to be real. Any opportunity that I have to teach the gospel, and I, I say this all the time. I feel like I'm a broken record because of how often I say this. I love to share the trials and the tribulations and the brokenness that I go through sometimes because I know that in that brokenness, God is going to show his glory all the more. And if, if we're all honest, when we come to this place and we all come to this realization that we're all broken, it just makes it a little easier, like that song said, for the door to be open and God's presence to come and move inside your heart. Okay, so this is, this is me being vulnerable right now. A few Wednesdays ago, I did a teaching on Acts chapter 4. And I know some of you guys know about this because people were calling me Speedy Gonzalez. I, um, I preached for, I want to say it was 12 minutes here on this stage. This, that's the quickest sermon ever preached on this stage. And I didn't realize that that was uh, what had happened. In my mind, I hit all my points, hit all my notes, and I'm like, this is how I'm going to say it. This is what I'm going to do. By the end of the day, or by the end of that night, I walked down right here to, to get ready to pray for people, and I looked down at my watch and realized how fast I actually went, and it was about 12, 13 minutes. And I made an eye contact. My wife was sitting in the front row. I made eye contact with her, and I just shook my head no. Because the thoughts that were going through my mind, if I'm being honest, was number one, I wasn't choosing my words wisely. Number two, I wasn't um, giving God any room to move. I just had what I planned, and that was that. But the worst one was that I wasn't enough that night. I went home with the thought that what I did wasn't enough for the kingdom of God. Luckily, there was people in my life who know my body language, and so they were able to see how I was, and they prayed for me, and it was great. But that night, in my mind, because of how quick I went because of how I, I wasn't as prepared or didn't give God a room, that night destroyed me. And then, and then God did something. That Sunday, we had an opportunity to come and baptize a high schooler um, that following Sunday. And as we were all out here and we were getting ready to baptize her, and it was just a, a beautiful thing, this random guy comes up to me and he says, hey, I, I want to talk about your message. And I was prepped already. I was like, all right, here comes the jokes, right? The Mr. Speedy, you know, like who, who like I, I'm just preparing myself. But then he, he starts to, to say things that I don't even remember hitting in my notes. But it was, it was the way that he interpreted it. And in that moment, towards the end of this conversation, he says that message to help me quit smoking. I was humbled. But this is why I'm excited now. I'm excited because I have a new joy and a new perspective when it comes to teaching. God showed me two things that day. The first one was that it's, I'm just the messenger. 
right? It's not up to me. And that helps me because the pressure gets relieved. All I have to do is just be obedient to what God's word is saying. I just have to be obedient and believe that he is speaking to me. Therefore, I can go and, and be used as a vessel. And then God does the rest. But how many times have we been here? But how many times will we feel like we're not adequate? Where we, feel, where we feel like we're not enough, whether this is our marriages, our family, our relationships in school, whatever it may be, that feeling of just like, oh, I'm not doing enough. Which brings me to the second thing. God showed me that if I take him anywhere with the little things that I do, he's gonna make and move mountains. What I've noticed in my life when it comes to these trials and these tribulations is that they can make a big footprint in your life if you allow them to. And I did. And so tonight, as we jump into Acts chapter 6, this is what I want to do. I want to have this hope and this confidence in every single one of us that we're coming here not to just listen to just another Wednesday message, but we're going to come and we're going to believe that God is going to use whatever it is that we talk about according to his word and that he's going to shape that and he's going to mold that and he's going to re reassure you and change some things in your life. We're going to pray for our heart change here tonight. And now I'm pumped. So are you guys ready? Let's pray this. Let's pray this. God, we just thank you so much for what you're doing in this place. God, we thank you for this amazing, amazing community that we all get to be a part of. And Father, right now, God, I, I, I know that as believers, we have a target on our backs. And so, Father, I just pray for that heart change. God, I ask right now that you would start to move things in and out of our heart, filter the things that do not need to be in our thought process right now in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, that your word would consume us, change us, make us more like you. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. And amen. So we're going to be Acts chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verse 1. And to this point, in the book of Acts, there's, there's some stuff happening. Satan is using all kinds of different tactics to attack the church, whether this is through corruption within the church, whether this is um, through different types of people coming against each other, whether it's intimidation or direct opposition, right? And, and we, we see something here, Acts starting in verse 1. It says this, now in these days... When the disciples were increasing in number, so the church is growing, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. There are two types of people in this story. There's two types of people in this church and in this congregation. We have the Hebrews and then we have the Hellenists. The Hebrews see the Hellenists as um, individuals who are so easily, not corrupted, but so easily influenced by the world around them. And um, the word that they use um, in many commentaries is they're unspiritual compromisers. Uh, these are the Hellenists, unspiritual compromisers. And the Hellenists regard the Hebrews as holier than thou traditionalists. Right? So there's two different people that are attending this church. And what happens is the situation, the Hebrews, they're seeing that the church is growing. They're seeing things are happening, right? Things are, things are great, things are, things are moving, there's growth. But in a congregation of that size, it's inevitable for someone's needs to be overlooked. And so what happens is the Hebrews are overlooking, taking care of the widows and the Hellenists are like, oh, heck no. Like, who do the Hebrews think they are? The situation that we see here, and it's, it's the first type of adversity, which I didn't give you guys this, but the title for today is uh, dealing with adversity. But the first type of adversity that we see here is we see the Hebrews just living life, church is growing, they're committing a wrong, but they don't have any idea that they're committing the wrong. And then we have the Hellenists on the other hand. And they're going like, I can't believe these people. They are, they, are, they are hurting the church by not taking care of the widows. The Hebrews are right in their hearts. The Hellenists are right in their facts. Tell me we haven't been here before where an unintentional wrong begins a conflict in your life. It was funny because when I was studying for this and I was trying to find stories that I can apply um, to this situation specifically, but where an, un, um, 
a, a situation that, that you don't mean to do, this, this wrong that you don't mean to commit ends up becoming um, bigger than it needs to be. I was, I, I was sitting down and I was thinking about all the times my wife and I get in arguments. And I even asked her, I said, I was like, love, is, is there ever a situation where I did something unintentionally um, and it hurt you? We came to the conclusion that 90% of the, the arguments that we do, um, or that I do, um, ends up becoming this conflict of interest, right? It, it ends up hurting us. And the biggest thing, and this is me being honest, the biggest thing that I've seen in my marriage is, and I'm only a year and a half in, a little over a year and a half, so I'm fresh. I need some ideas. Help me out afterwards. Um, but the, the one thing that I've noticed is my, my focus has been my job, my focus has been my future. My focus has been my ministry. And my focus has been my community. And because I live with my wife, she gets the scraps. Because in my head, I'm going, my, like, I, I see you every day. Like, I see you every morning and I see you every night. Like, we spend enough time together. And then we have, like, one day on Tuesdays where it's date night. So it's, it's fine. Like, this is great. Like, things are moving. This was my unintentional wrong, not knowing that this was actually affecting her more than I thought it was. Luckily, I have uh, some people in my life who called me and kind of snapped me out of it. I actually attend a Bible study at the Northwest Campus and with some of the individuals there. And we got into this debate on the things that I was doing right and the things I was doing wrong. But it's needed. Like, people were there to kind of check me. That night, um, we ended up going to Chick-fil-A. And my wife sat me down, and, and we talked this out. And to be honest, it was, it was something that was beautiful. Like, just because we talked it out, something amazing came out of this, and the reward was amazing. I, someone gave me a thumbs up. Not like that. Um, I'm talking just it, it, God restored the situation. Okay, there's high schoolers in here. Um, God restored it. But this is, this is what I'm saying. There's a conflict that is happening between the Hellenists and the Hebrews, and this conflict can actually separate the church. I've seen this happen in the church. I've seen people leave the church because something was said that they didn't like or something was said and it offended them and instead of talking it out, they just go on and do their own thing and take off and leave their community because of this unintentional conflict or this unintentional wrong that the church did. And I've seen this happen in marriages. I've seen this happen in friendships. There's a verse in scripture in 1 Peter 5 eight, and it says that the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion just waiting for someone to devour waiting to wreck your marriages, waiting to wreck your family, to wreck your community. And it, what's, what's nuts about this, and we're going to see this in a second on what they do, but what's nuts about this is that if we allow it to, this unintentional wrong, this style of adversity can legit ruin what God is trying to do in your life. So it's a big deal. Right? We have the Hellenists and the Hebrews, this unintentional wrong, and there, there could be the separation of the church, but instead, this is what happens. We're going to go to Acts, starting in verse 3, and this is the 12 had just gathered all the disciples together, and they come up with this plan because someone decided to bring this up. And this is what it says. It says, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom, we'll, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Peramen, Peramenenus, whatever that is, and Nicholas, and a proselyte of Antioch. Very hard words. But then right here. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on him. My first point when it comes to this type of adversity is simple. It's they just talked it out and prayed. They talked it out and prayed. Right? They, they, didn't, they didn't do any crazy, like they didn't go to the river and say, we got to stay here and pray for 40 hours or you got to go on timeout or first you got to make it up. Like there was none of that. The only thing that they did is they got together, they talked the conflict out and they prayed. I was, I was looking up this business insider from uh, Harvard and it was crazy because this, this article talks about the power of communication, the power of just talking things out. And don't get me wrong, if you're anything like me, I try and avoid conflict at all costs. Like there are times where that night at Chick-fil-A, 
and my wife was trying to have this serious conversation with me, I just kept trying to put a chicken nugget in her mouth. And, um, but this is, it's, it's, there's, there's power behind this. Check this out. I found this article. This is what it says. It says that the benefits of talking are not clearly understood by many people. But these are the things that they listed. That talking, whether there's a conflict, whether there's just you by yourself and you need to reassure yourself, this is what it does. Not only does it make you feel better, but it helps organize your thoughts. It helps uh, lead to new solutions. It creates intimacy. It builds community. And it changes the course of your future. And what scripture says when words have power is that God spoke the world into existence, right? That there is life and death in the power of the tongue and that the words of an upright delivers man. There is power behind talking this out. And you know what the outcome was because they decided to talk it out and pray? Let's go to Acts 6, starting in verse 7. This was the outcome because they didn't, they didn't avoid it. They didn't take off. There was no division. This is what they did. They talked it out, and it says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. God's will was being accomplished, all because they talked it out and pray. I don't know who this is for, but if there is some burdens in your heart, if there is some unforgiveness in your heart, if, you are, if you're in here today and you are burnt by something the church did, sometimes you just got to talk it out and pray. Because when we don't, this is going back to that verse, 1 Peter 5, 8, the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. If we don't, the enemy capitalizes on this and creates that division and creates this wall between you and what God is wanting to do in your life. It's dangerous. Let's continue. There's another type of adversity that's talked about in Acts chapter 6. We're jumping all the way to verse 10, but before I do, out of the seven men that were chosen, one of them, as we read, his name is Stephen. It's the easier name to pronounce. And so Stephen is considered this man that's full of wisdom and power and grace, and it's because of the Holy Spirit. And so Stephen goes along, and he's preaching in the synagogue. And he's creating these wonders, and then there are the opposing Jews who see what he's doing, and they don't like what he's doing. So what they do is they start to debate Stephen. But Stephen has the Holy Spirit, and so Stephen just crushes it, and they get upset. And this is, this is what happens, Acts, starting in verse 10, it says this, But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came up upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. It continues, it says, and they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Not only did they induce these false accusations against Stephen, but if you notice, these are the same accusations that they gave Jesus that led him to take the cross. They put Stephen in a sticky situation. This is, this is the haters, right? These are people who don't want to see you succeed. And they're seeing Stephen. They're going, let's, let's get this man to get persecuted. Let's get this man to be put to death. And so they all come together. They get all of these random people to say all these false accusations against this man. But look at Stephen's confidence. Acts 6, starting in verse 15 it says this, and gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like that face of an angel. This isn't because he got a facial, right? It's, it's not, they're not talking about his skin glowing. I looked into this. Many commentaries say that they described him in this manner because Stephen had this boldness and this confidence because he knew that his life didn't rely on those who accused him, that his life relied on Jesus and Jesus alone. This is what gave him that confidence. This is what gave him that strength. And what's nuts is that no one, like Stephen didn't just like, 
he didn't watch a podcast on how to be great, right? He didn't watch a podcast on, on how to have this type of peace. He didn't go and, 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 and watch someone preach on a pulpit to get this type of peace. Like, he didn't go out and do any of these things. The only thing that Stephen does is he's obedient to what God says. He's obedient to the word. He's obedient to the spirit that lives already inside of, of him, the same spirit that lives inside of us. He's obedient to that, and that's the peace that he was able to surpass even in the midst of persecution. This is tough. It's tough because when you think about it, like the times that we've been cut off, right, that we've been in our own types of adversity, how many times have we failed? I, like, I got, like, no one told me that I did a bad job a few Wednesdays ago. No one told me that, hey, you know, you suck. Don't ever do that. Like, that never happened. This was my own thoughts that got in my head. I wasn't relying on the Holy Spirit. I was relying on what I thought was right. This is an issue that we see not just in Scripture, but in our own lives. And then look what happens towards the end in in this type of piece. This brings me to my second point. But it's this, understanding that your life is in God's hands. Understanding that your life, when you deal with any type of adversity, understanding that your life doesn't rely on fear, it doesn't rely on money, right? It doesn't rely on on what's going to happen five years from now. It relies on God. And when we come to this understanding, it is easier for him to move in our hearts and change us to be the great people that he's called us to be. This is a peace that surpasses all understanding when we understand that our life is in his hands. I was, I was listening to this pastor in LA and he came up with a pretty cool analogy, but he was saying that he, he went to New York and in New York, there's this museum and it was, it was an art museum and they had different types of rooms. And then for those different types of rooms, they had different categories, right? They, they had one that was um, like the fun room and you would go in and everything was interactive. Then they had one and it was the terrifying room and it was about all like your fears. And they had one and it, like they had just a bunch of different things. But he says he found the room that was titled peace. And This pastor said he gets in there and he gets in the room and immediately the moment he stepped in, this room was colder than the rest of the other rooms. He said there was was zero peace about this room. He walks in, he says he's freezing and there's one picture on the wall and this this room is like the light isn't dimmed right. It's like like the hospital lights. You know what I'm talking about? Like the, like the, it it gives you like the the ooey gooeys, you know? I don't know what the heck that is. But um, he walks up and he goes to this, this picture frame and in the painting, there's this thunderous waterfall. And the skies, they're gray, and it looks like a storm's coming in. There's zero peace about this. And he said when he looked at the thunderous waterfall, there was this flimsy branch, and at the end of the branch was this nest. And on that nest was this bird. And it was with, you know, the babies. And she was sleeping. It was resting. This bird was, was resting. And what he ends up saying when he saw this, he said he realized this is the type of peace that you and I could tap into at any given moment when we give our lives to Christ. This is the type of peace that you and I can experience even if you haven't come to church in who knows how many years, even if you haven't read, you know, the whole Bible, even like you don't have to do any of these things because God is always willing to meet you where you're at and reveal himself to you. And that's the peace that we can get starting right now. That type of peace. He doesn't say you you have to be perfect before I can give you like, no, he just says, come to me, accept me and you can have it. It's there. Let's continue to my third and and final point because that's the end of uh, Acts chapter 6. But my third and final point is in Psalms 4. I I got this story. My wife, she's just amazing. She reads the Bible more than any other person I know in my life. And every morning uh, she she meditates. Every now and again when I sleep in, I kind of like peek like an eye and I see that she's like doing her word and just getting like in it. And for some reason, I don't know why that intimidates me, so I fall back asleep. But, um, but she's sitting, like she, she does this thing where she goes, she'll make her coffee or she'll work out, make her coffee, sit down, and then she journals. And then she reads this book first. It's a devotional. And then she reads her Bible. 
in this devotional, I picked it up one day just because I wanted to see, I just wanted to read something from there. And it was back in March 16th. And this devotional was talking about David. And it's this story here. And it talks about this crazy type of peace. But Psalms 4, if you guys have that, and it says this. It's really short, so bear with me. It says this, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O oh men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lives? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Selah. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. And this is my favorite one. It says, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. When David is writing this, it sounds like life is great. But what, what I ended up finding out and what this devotional book was talking about was this man, David, is, he's writing this from a cave. It's not his palace. It's not his home. It's not something that he's comfortable with. He's in a cave with a few of his buddies. And why he's in there is because the son that he loved, the son that is his blood is out to take his throne. And in monarchy... In order for you to take someone's throne, you have to kill him. He's hiding from his son in this cave where he's not familiar with anything. Think about the emotions. Think about the thought process that he's going through. And in that moment, there's, there's, there's something beautiful that happens. In that moment, he says, can we pull up that last verse again? Verse 8, Acts 6, verse 8. He says, in peace I will both lie down and sleep. Regardless, he's not, there's, there's, it's just emptiness. He doesn't know what his next step is. This is a type of adversity that's tough. The fear of the future, right? Are you going to keep your job? Like what, what's going to happen with your marriages? What's going to happen with your family? What's going to happen with school? What's going to happen if you don't get, like there's decisions that are life changing and this guy is sitting there and he has no idea what's next, but he says, it doesn't matter because in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. How beautiful is that? My third and final point is this, that our peace and joy is not rooted in circumstances, but rooted in, in Christ. For those of you guys who know, my dad, uh, he passed away last year. It was one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with. And for the longest time, I, I had this, this anger because how he died, it wasn't, it wasn't because of old age. It wasn't because of Health issues is because of, mis of a mistake. And for the longest time, that destroyed me. And I, I, I could never really have this like, type of peace about it. And anytime we talked about it, I would just avoid the question. Anytime someone asked to pray for me, when it, the whole situation went down and people started knowing the truth, um, I just didn't really want to hear it. I can confidently say that peace that David had that peace that Stephen had, the peace that the, that the Hellenists and the Hebrews had after all of this different types of adversity that took place, I can confidently say that in my life, I know that my circumstance doesn't have any control in my life. My joy and my peace, and I'm talking about the deepest of levels of your joy and your peace is rooted in Christ. And if you've never been in this situation before, if you're in here and you, and you, whether you haven't given your life to God or you want to rededicate your life, let me just say this, that 
Job says whether you're born from a woman, which everyone's born from a woman, expect trials to happen. Expect them. Whether, you, whether you're a believer or not, there's this lie that if you do God's will, then you won't deal with any true issues. That's a lie. Right? God even's like, we might even be persecuted way worse for doing God's work. But I will say this. I will say this. Regardless, you're a Christian or not, you're going to go through stuff. But I will say this. Those who are believers, and you guys, let me know if I'm telling the truth. Those who are believers, the peace that we get when we deal with any type of adversity surpasses all understanding. That's the peace that only comes from God. So we're going to have people come up here in a second. I'm going to be, I'm going to be done here. But we're going to have people come up, and we're going to, we're going to do prayer. Here's my hope and my prayer for you guys. And I tell this to my high schoolers all the time. Don't wait on another day. Scripture says that we're not even promised tomorrow. If you want to experience this type of peace, if you want to experience this type of relationship, this just comes from God. All you have to do is just be obedient and come and get that prayer. You can already be a believer. You can be in your relationship with God but if you're not obedient to what he's wanting you to do, it's going to be very difficult for you to see him move in your life. So I'm going to have uh, people come up. We'll be here. I'll be here. We'll be praying for you. Um, but just take the lead today. Don't wait for tomorrow. God wants to do stuff in your life right now. And this isn't me selling anything, but I just know the God that I serve, the God that I follow, and he wants, and it wants to accept and change and reassure every single person in this building. Did you guys get something out of tonight? Amen. Let's pray. God, right now, Lord, we just, we thank you for tonight in particular. God, I, I pray right now that if our focus is in anything else, remove those thoughts, and I pray right now that we would think about this moment. Only you know what's going on in our hearts. Father, your word says that everything that comes out of our heart is dictated by the things that we allow filter into our hearts. So God, I pray if there's any bad stuff right now, God, help us filter that out through prayer. God, if, if there are things that are, that are blocking this message, if there are things that are blocking you from moving in their lives, God, remove it in the name of Jesus. We trust what you're going to be doing from here on out. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen and amen. Thank you, guys. Come get prayer. We're here. We love you. God bless. Hey, guys. We hope you got something out of that message. Feel free to visit our website at vbf.org to watch our latest sermons. Follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon.